So, um, as far as I understand the course, you have been talking about mostly data analysis and statistical issues, and I thought it might be useful to uh, to also make some comments from the data side, because when you work on data as they uh, presented to you from the data analysis point of view, there's a lot of things to consider where the data come from, what the data means, and so on. So I, so that this is entitled some considerations from the data generation side. So first I'd like to put this a little bit in context where we are in this proteomics field, and then I will try to make, if time is allows, uh, some specific comments on five distinctive uh, distinct topics. So first, I would like to put this proteomics field where we are now a little bit into perspective. You probably all have seen this picture or remember the time when even the precise date when uh, the draft of the human genome sequence was announced by, at the time, uh, President Clinton and Prime Minister Tony Blair. And with this announcement came very specific expectations. And these expectations were predictions what scientists would be able to do with this genome sequence. And so they're listed here. This is original text from the US government press release. And it basically says, one should find better biomarkers to alert patients that they're at risk, to reliably predict the course of disease, so make projections how a person's health status will evolve, to diagnose disease more precisely and make it and find effective treatment and then develop entirely new treatments. And the idea was that, that these, these monumental achievements would be generated or would be apparent directly from the genomic sequence and not the genomic sequence of an individual patient, but from the genomic sequence of this drug. So I think we would now, we would now say um, in hindsight, that this was probably overambitious. I think very, very few people would go and say, I, I get a genome sequence, any genome sequence, and predict any of these things out of the sequence alone. But what then happened, I think, what was triggered is this enormous decay in, in cost and the enormous explosion in speed. So that now one does not need to rely on a generic draft genome sequence to learn something about biology. Of course, we have learned a lot also about the, the genome and its organization from the original draft. I'm not saying this was not useful, but in respect to these predictions, I think that this was, this was too ambitious. But now we have obviously reached the time when we can um, sequence virtually everyone, even if they have a relatively small laboratory, um, sequence whole genomes of cohorts of individuals. So I think the genomics revolution that we're in the middle, midst of it, uh, where we're in the midst of it now, did not necessarily come from the initial uh, draft, although this was certainly informative and a <coughs> monumental achievement, but from the practical uh, at attempt to achieve the goals that were stated. This is, came from the fast, accurate, and highly reproducible measurement of thousands genomes, GWAS studies, transcriptomes, now even down to the single cell level. So we, in the field of proteomics, we of course always follow things with a, with a good time lag, and this gives us the opportunity to observe what other fields are doing, specifically genomics. And so we, we are in this field of proteomics, and we thought that we would learn from from these developments, from going from a draft to rapid, highly accurate, and relatively cheap re-measurement of many samples. And so a while back, we proposed in a, in a review, where we reviewed the general landscape, that it would be useful for the field of proteomics to also achieve a map, which would be a reliable map, which would, inc which would, would contain the information about all the proteins of the human body, for instance, the human one, and then use this map as a, as, as a guide or as an aid to, um, to, to 
and then do repeat measurements at high throughput and high degree of reliability. So um, the first part, this, map, this mapping has been going very well. So this is uh, a project we started when, uh, when I was at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. And it has continued since. And there are several other projects, for instance, also by, um, uh, by, by Mike McCoss, which attempt which have similar objectives. The objective simply was to say there is a lot of laboratories worldwide that do discovery type proteomics. They generate a lot of data and by the way also burn through a lot of money and it would be good to capture this the, the ensemble, the cumulative information in these data sets and not just the, the partial data sets that eventually end up in a paper. So the idea of this project was to ask scientists around the world to generate discovery proteomic data to donate the data, the raw spectra, and then the project simply was to integrate this in a database and to search the data cumulatively to see what fraction of the proteome this uh, cumulative data would, uh, would cover. So you can see here, this is uh, just a, a curve of data that has been um, submitted, that there is an enormous decrease of, of really massive amounts of data that are now uh, deposited in these databases. These are all, they're all kind of connected through a, in, in what's called a proton exchange consortium, but I don't want to get into this. And right now we believe that about a million distinct peptides have been uh, identified credibly from the human proteome. So this is actually a fairly large number. And when we look at the saturation of the human proteome, what has been discovered uh, by mass spectrometry, various types of instruments, various types of sample preparation methods, uh, it's about um, 14 to 14 and a half thousand proteins. There's fairly good consensus in that. Now you might, you might say, well, this is not the map because it's not complete. Clearly there's more protein coding um, genes in the human genome than proteins have been discovered. We also make no statement here about complications like splice forms, proteoforms, modifications. This is simply how many loci have been observed and the level of proteins that they actually exist. And this is about uh, this number. And you can also see when very large additional data sets have been added, they don't discover a, a whole lot of new proteins. And I think there's fairly, fairly good consensus in the field that we have reached roughly with the present method um, of discovering proteins, uh, roughly reached saturation. Not completeness, but, but saturation. So. This basically um, is the first part of this strategy to map out a proteome. And we would now have for a, a million or so of peptides, we know that they exist. We know they're visible by a mass spectrometer. We know that they're generated by the process that we generally use of triplet digestion and mass spectrometry. And then we know the, ma the, the fragment ion spectrum that is being generated from this peptide. So this is actually a very useful map. And now what we would like to do, and this is I think transition, we are in, in the in presently in the field of proteomics to go to the second step and, and ask, can we use um, this information has been accumulated in a sensible way to um, quickly, accurately, and reproducibly quantify thousands of proteomes. We can obviously not do this completely. But at least for a certain subset, ideally all the observed or previously discovered part of the proteome, we should be able to, to do this. That's at least the goal. So, so this what is what some of us think is really the transforming wave in proteomics that the, we can go on to very large data sets, do lots of measurements, do them in a, with moderate effort and with, with high, quality, high quality and reproducibility. So this is, I think, where we are now. And I think a lot of the um, discussions in the course from the statistical side already centered around this theme. So now, based on this scenario, I would like to comment on five points. And we'll see how far we get in with time. I'd also ask you if you have questions or comments to interrupt. This is, uh, we certainly can do this uh, during, during uh, the lecture. This have discussion during the lecture. So the first um, 
would like to, to make an argument that the new, uh, in this scenario, the currency of data is no longer a list of proteins identified in a sample, but a matrix of proteins, <coughs> preferably pre precisely quantified across many samples. So this is the consequence for this transformation I'm trying to, um, to explain. And I will make a few comments about this matrix. Then we'll make a few comments. How do we generate such data matrices with mass spectrometers? This I think I can do very quickly because a lot of these things have been already discussed. Then I would like, like to make a few comments. What dimension should such a data matrix have to be maximally informative or maximally useful? For instance, for biomarker studies or for some other uh, classification studies. In other words, should we put our weight, if we have 100% effort to give, should we put this effort on finding as many proteins as possible in few samples or a certain number of proteins in as many samples as possible? And then the next point, I will try to make, make, or make a few comments about sources of variation that we observe, but specifically, specifically sources of biological variation which is usually neglected. We usually assume that if that proteins um, are, let's say, on a pop overpopulation, reasonably equally expressed in different individuals or in different cells, and that's not so. So that I'm going to make a few comments about biological variation and why and where this um, is coming from. And then um, the last point is: Can we avoid recognizing correct? Artifactual variation, basically batch effects and other and other effects. So this, these are all points which arise from this scenario that I tried to uh, outline at the beginning. So now I make a few comments about this data matrix. Many of us, at least the older ones, um, have grown up in a field um, in in in, bio, in biology um, to learn about reductionist world or hypothesis driven science where we formulate a specific problem and this problem usually or frequently centers around the effect of a particular um, factor <clears throat> for instance a protein or, or a gene or a mutation in a gene and many departments have um, are centered around genetics cell biology biochemistry structural biology and so on and the all on what on these have been extremely effective in a hypothesis driven way to learn a lot about biological processes and to identify molecules that have specific functions. For instance, in the field of met metabolism, you can go to a computer and a computer will tell you basically every for every biochemical reaction, every, every metabolic reaction, which enzyme is catalyzed in this reaction, what is the product, what is the adduct, what is the catalytic constant. So, so a huge amount of information has been accumulated. It is, however, in some level, this approach is in some level limited because my, while you might learn a lot about a specific metabolic enzyme or a chromatin remodeling pro, um, complex, uh, these, all these operations, of course, occur in a cell at the same time when many other operations or functions happen. And what is, what, what is difficult to establish with these reductionist approaches is the connections between uh, different molecules, reactions, and what's usually referred to as pathways or networks. So if we want to find a specific factor, for instance, a factor that is um, stimulating a cell to grow, and we know that this factor is a protein, then the classical discovery proteomic methods have been very effective and need to be effective because we need to discover in this scenario a protein that has a specific function, for instance a growth factor, an oncogenic factor, or whatever the case may be. For that, this, this um, matrix, uh, matrix discussion does not really apply because we're looking for in a sample for a factor that has a specific tractable function, and there it means we need to discover as many proteins as possible in that specific sample. Of course, usually there's some control samples to see whether it 
that which factor actually that is discovered has the specific function. But more recently, I think driven mostly by the genomic um, revolution, there has been the, the big data world or data-driven research where we, where we generate data sets of this, this matrix type, usually or ideally in suitably structured cohorts. For instance, in the clinic, such a cohort might be a cohort of patients with a particular disease and suitable controls. And then we would do measurements and through, through some of the methods that you have learned or will now learn in this particular module, we try to find constellations of molecules that have a certain association, for instance, with the disease phenotype or some other function. And here, the important thing is um, we can collect large proteomic data sets. We can have many which, which are supporting this type of analysis, um, but we, we then basically augment the picture I showed before, how many uh, biological research departments are being structured. This is a classical hypothesis driven by, by um, biologists with, not, with, with new type of biologists, which are the data-driven biologists who work with large amounts of data. And the usual, and, and preferably with well-structured large data sets. The, we learn here the behavior of a system from the large data sets, but I think the main, the main, the main um, point that we learned now, and we, we, for instance, try to structure our department at ETH Zurich around, is that neither this side, which basically comes up with suggested associations like GWAS associations, but they do, which do not really explain lots of the biochemistry, we try to combine or somehow merge the data from here with the data from here with some form of integrated quantitative model about the process. We don't actually know really how to do this. Uh, this is, I think, really, really, really work in progress. And I think to some extent this module is about uh, questions like, like this. But I think what, where we are now, at least from the proteomic side, we are now in a position to generate the data sets that support data-driven science. And this is actually reasonably new, and that we can then combine this with the biochemical knowledge. So this is basically what I'm talking about, which I think is the is the exciting phase we're in in the field of proteomics. We're no longer trying to, or, or most, most, for the most part, we're no longer trying to discover as many proteins as possible, but we try to generate such data matrices because they contain a lot of information that we can try to extract. And, and how we extract it ex exactly, I think to, to a large extent, is not really so clear, uh, but it is, it is clearly apparent that this type of research, also if you go to uh, anal analogies in genomics, that, the, that this is a very useful approach. Okay, so now, um, so I tried now in this first one here, I tried to explain why we are interested in generate such data matrices and because they support a different type of analysis, a data-driven uh, way of analyzing. Prototypical example would be biomarker studies or clinical classification, but of course it goes much further into also basic biology. Now we'd like to make a few comments how do we generate such data matrices by mass spectrometry. So I think I'm gonna go quite fast because much of that has already been think discussed, it will be discussed further, but I think it's important also to put this a little bit in perspective of the of the of this uh, lecture. So this is where we would like to go. We would like to be able to have many, maybe thousands of different conditions of samples that generate reliable and highly accurate um, data sets on the proteome from each one of the samples, so we would like to have a, we would like to have a data matrix with very little, very few missing values and very good quantification. 
So we would like to quantify, ideally, all proteins with soft small positions, but we can't. So in, if you work or have colleagues who work in the field of transcriptomics, this is largely possible. This is through being through the uh, enormous advances in next generation sequencing. I think one would be, uh, most people would agree, that if one sequence is deep enough, one will eventually get enough reads to, co to dis discover and quantify virtually every transcript uh, that is in a human cell or in a, in a tissue. But in proteomics, we can't really do that yet. And I think we're actually quite far off uh, because the proteome is, at, at many levels, um, very complicated. And some of the um, nice tools, for instance, amplification, of course, we don't have apply to genomics. We don't have available in the field of proteins. We basically have to measure what we extract. So, so now, we, if, we, if we accept grudgingly that we cannot do the optimal experiment, we can do somewhat suboptimal experiments, but that still, that still fulfill our needs. And I talked about two needs. The one is to discover proteins in one or a few samples. And the other is to basically go over, over in that dimension with high reproducibility across many samples. Or maybe not all proteins, but at least a reproducible subset. And to achieve that, essentially two types of proteomic approaches have, have developed. Um, in both of them, there's lots of variation of the methods. But one is, one is intended to discover proteins in a sample, and the other is to systematically and hopefully accurately quantify a set of proteins across many samples. So the one would be to go as deep as possible here, to have relatively few samples. And the other would be to go as broad as possible here, but to have as many proteins as possible, but, but the, the number of proteins is somewhat limited and small. The one going down here is referred to as data dependent analysis or discovery or shotgun proteomics. The one over here going in this dimension is usually referred to as targeted proteomics. More recently, um, this has also been for reasons which will be discussed, I think also uh, later on, as, as, as peptide-centric analysis as opposed to spectrum-centric analysis. This is terminology that actually was largely coined uh, by Mike because I think it's very appropriate terminology. Whatever we do, we always start with proteins, but we don't actually measure proteins. There is, incidentally, a field of proteomics which attempts to measure directly the intact proteins, referred to as top-down proteomics. This is not really discussed here because it has its own issues and uh, also data and, and technical issues, and it is, at, at, at the moment, not at the same level of maturity as this bottom-up proteomic uh, approach that we are um, discussing here. So all these bottom-up proteomic approaches have in common that we start with proteins, usually a mixture of proteins, that are ingested, usually with trypsin, and then peptides are separated, they're ionized, um, by, separated by, by reverse trypsin protein, ionized by uh, usually electrospray ionization source, and then spectra are being generated, so the particular precursor peptides are selected, um, and then they're fragmented. And the currency of identification is always fragmented spectra of a, of a peptide. So, so all methods basically go through these steps, but they do it somewhat differently. A very important issue that we don't have time to discuss, but which is always um, complicated, it's basically not resolved, at, at the fundamental level, and it's also the source of a lot of problems and false results, false positive results, is the inference of the proteins that supposedly are in the sample based on the peptides that are correctly identified by a mass spectrometer and suitable data analysis tools. So here we are in pretty safe ground. We have protein samples, we generate peptides, we generate fragment ion spectra of individual peptides, and, and these, is, these peptides can be actually very, very reliably uh, identified today. Um, how we go back here from the 
pep identified peptides or a list of thousands of peptides which are confidently identified to make a statement which proteins are actually in the sample that are, and that are represented by the peptides that are identified. Is, um, is there is no real good solution. Um, there is some assumptions, there are various models that make certain assumptions and the numbers that come out and the type of proteins that come out from these models always of course depend on the nature of the, of the model. So I would, I, I don't have uh, pl plans or time to, to spend more, uh, more words on this topic. I just like to say that this part, this part here, we're on very solid ground. This part here, um, we're mu much less on solid ground. It's not that people make mistakes, but the results depend on certain assumptions that the models use. And, and this, uh, and when this, if this is not explained, the output of these models is not really, uh, is not really, really all that meaningful. And oftentimes, these models are not really well explained, for instance, <coughs> in research papers. Okay, so now uh, I want very briefly, I think uh, most, mostly this is uh, known stuff, so I go very fast. We distinguish between discovery proteomics and targeted acquisition. We always view a proteome as an ensemble of peptides in this bottom-up proteomics, and we can always represent it in two dimensions as the evolution, chromatographic evolution time. This is how peptides evolve sequentially from the chromatographic column. And the precursor mass range, which is the mass, or more specifically the mass to charge ratio of a specific peptide, that is, has been ionized by the mass spectrometer. So here we see, in this, in this schematic representation, we see various signals. They are, each one represents a peptide. Of course, you see here that each peptide has more than one signal. Actually, that's detected. This comes from natural isotopic distribution. And, but we have a large number of these signals, and, and now they're analyzed in different ways, in either the discovery or in the targeted analysis um, data acquisition strategy. In the data-dependent analysis or shotgun technique, the mass spectrometer basically does what this computer just did now. It will, it will detect such signals and then select them for fragmentation and generate a reference, a, 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 a fragmentine spectrum of this specific peptide or two specific peptides imagine if there's a very, very large number of these peptides, uh, this was highly, highly populated, you, the mass spectrometer, will have a hard time to select every peptide and generate a fragmentine spectrum. Simply for reasons of time, throughput, but also when you overlay enough of those, eventually they start to overlay each other, and it's not so clear yet what actually is what selected. So this is an extremely powerful technique to discover what samples are in the, in the, um, in the, which peptides are in the sample. But if there is a much larger number of peptides present in sequencing cycle, then the number of those go unreported in a specific sample. And if you do it over and over again, not always the same peptides go unreported. And that leads then, when we talk about the data matrix, to some extent, to missing values. Not all the pep, not all the time, the same peptides are being selected for fragmentation. The other side is the principle of the targeted analysis that just shows that these are each one of these operations generates a fragmentine spectrum, which is then searched against a database. The other side, the targeted data acquisition, does not care about all the peptides in the sample. It cares about a specific subset that the user has to identify. A priori and tell the instrument what it wants to, what the instrument should measure. So even if there is very highly prominent signals like this one here and this one here, the mass spectrometer won't care about them unless it's instructed to look for these peptides specifically. And the way it, do, it does look for these peptides specifically is that the operator says, I, I'm expecting in my sample a peptide with a particular mass, for instance, six, 
651. And I know that sample is, it have this in there. I want to quantify it in my specific sample. And if I have 100 other samples, I always want to quantify the specific peptide in each one of the samples. Ignoring many of the other peptides, and it does that by basically selecting periodically every, let's say, every 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 one or two of these seconds, a, the precursor that is corresponding to the target peptide. It would select it, it fragments it, and then it does it again and again and again, all the way through here in the whole time, throughout the time. So if this peptide that we want to target that has a certain precursor mass in the four sequence is actually in the sample, it has no way to escape detection because the mass spectrometer will always measure this uh, peptide again at a time frequency which is much faster than the chromatographic peak resolution that this peptide might have, which is basically given by the boundaries of such a peak. So you see we have multiple measurements of the same peptide. In my say measurement, it selects these peptides uh, based on the precursor mass, and then it fragments them in a collision cell and records either a whole fragment ion spectrum, or it records or it, or it measures only specific subset of the fragment ions which, which have to be also predetermined. If it measures the whole spectrum, as is shown here, schema uh, schematically, then this technique is referred to as uh, PRM, or if we do, uh, if it measures specific fragment ion signals that are predetermined and it and, and describing specifically a peptide, the technique is referred to as SRM or um, selective reaction mode. So here you will see when the, when the selection goes through, um, this peptide is always selected. Here is nothing present, there is basically a plastic straw. And then in a PRM experiment, eventually, that is detected, repeats, and then it goes away. But every time the same spectrum is basically being generated, and then the, then one can one can reconstruct a chromatographic uh, representation of the of the fragment ions that are that are coming from this peptide. So we don't get just a random um, fragmentation of the peptide somewhere in the evolution. We get a reconstructed ion chromatogram for the precursor, but also for a number of characteristic fragment ions. And so each curve here will be one particular fragment ion derived from the target peptide. And we have a, multi a multitude of such um, fragment ion traces. And if they all coevolve, if they have the right mass, if they have the right retention time, if the right relative the boundaries, we can be absolutely sure that the that the peptide that we target was actually present in the sample, and the intensity of the signals represents the quantity of the target peptide. So we have now described two tracks or that have been developed or evolved over time in the in mass spectrometry-based photomap proteomics. The one is the, this discovery approach usually used to identify large numbers of proteins. It's not uncommon to see papers which claim in the order of 10,000 different proteins identified in a sample. But if you want to do this for more than a few samples, it becomes very involved, very expensive also, and has, num has a number of issues that I don't really need to discuss. Or we have this targeted method, the exemplified by PRM or SRM, where a certain number, a low number, maybe in the range range of hundreds or so peptides can be quantified very precisely in about many conditions. So this is um, this is the situation that we have at a trade-off, and of course it would be nice if we had a method which combines kind of the strength of either one of these approaches, and it would be a method that conforms to form consistent acquisition of a larger number of proteins, but with the same performance characteristics of these techniques. And this, and this technique has been developed over the last, let's say, five, six years, or a various approaches to this. And this has come to, para to parallelization. So again, we looked, we could look at genomics and ask how the genomics um, 
manage to go from a monumental effort to draft, to generate a draft genome sequence, to ba basically being able to, to sequence a genome, uh, even a very complex genome like the human one, in a relatively short time and with moderate effort. And the secret word for that, uh, that made this possible, is parallel measurements. So next generation sequencing is a technique which many, probably most of you, are familiar with, and it is not actually a fast technique. So a, a specific segment of DNA is not sequenced particularly quickly, but it is overall a very fast technique because it is extremely highly parallel. Every, uh, every, uh, every sequencing cycle, millions of DNA segments are sequenced in parallel, are sequenced in parallel, and so even though one sequencing cycle of one particular um, oligonucleotide or DNA segment takes a reasonable amount of time, maybe in the range of, of hour, hours, um, if you do, do this millions of times in parallel, uh, then of course it becomes very quick, very fast. So highly parallel in space was the, the secret of making um, genomics very high throughput, relatively cheap and reliable. And so um, scientists, including us, have tried to also come up with a parallel uh, sequencing method that would for proteins, more specifically for peptides. So we have here again the window of where the proteome is represented, so it's graphic extension time versus um, uh, precursor in mass. But now you see some real data um, as far as this goes, that each dot here is a precursor peptide detected by a mass spectrometer. And you see here enormously dense coverage, basically it's all black, so there's many peptides are eluding. We don't know actually how many, but it is certainly a very large number of peptides which are detectable by a mass spectrometer. And so the idea again was to basically not sequence every peptide because it's so many, but to, to sequence a number of them in parallel. And the solution to that is a technique that is uh, referred to as DIA, data independent analysis, and there's various incorporations of that which I don't want to discuss. Uh, the technique that we have been using is a segmented one. We basically segment this precursor ion range into a number of segments. It doesn't really matter how many, or it can be adapted, but several dozen segments, or maybe 25 to 30 segments. And then each precursor that is present in each one of these segments is concurrently fragmented. So we do not attempt to isolate a specific precursor and then fragment it, but we, we attempt to isolate packets of precursors, everyone who is in one of these segments here, and then fragment them all together. So we dis this generates a composite fragment ion spectrum, which is somewhat difficult to analyze, and I'll come now, we'll now briefly explain how, how this works. So we basically do, like we, we, which will remind you, I think those who pay attention, will remind you very much at the idea of SRM, where the mass spectrometer was instructed to, to walk through and repeatedly measure a specific precursor mass range and to fragment a target peptide of that in this range um, and do it repeatedly. Here now we do not specify a specific peptide precursor mass, but we simply specify uh, ranges that the mass spectrometer will uh, select the same range over and over and over again, so that overall at the end of the data acquisition, um, the whole, the whole window here represents the proteome has been completely covered and, and, and seamlessly covered by little pixels consisting of a time where this particular window is selected and the width of the window. So effectively, um, this is a particular implementation with 20, 32 um, uh, windows, but this, the number of windows is not important. The principle is important. And the principle says that we basically pixelize this, win this whole window here of where the peptides elude, and the, in, so there's several thousands of these pixels 
are being acquired. And the peptides are acquired not as individual peptide fragments, but as packages of peptides which happen to be present in each one of these pixels. And these data are recorded. And now the question is, of course, how do we analyze this data? Because you can imagine that if we were to take the data acquired from this window here in a very busy area of this, of this uh, photo map, uh, maybe there's a dozen, maybe there's a hundred peptides in there, and if they're all concurrently fragmented and sent to a sequence database search engine, uh, it will not work. Because the search engine has no way to know which fragment ion that's detected is originating from which precursor. So the, the trick to resolve that is to recognize that we are actually dealing with a data structure that's very, very, very similar to SRM or PRM data, where precursor, where a particular precursor peptide that is contained, let's say, in the segment, will be fragmented over and over again in the course of the acquisition of the data. And so is, of course, every other peptide here too, because we saw that the data is basically uh, everything is, is fragmented in, 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 in its own window. <coughs> so now we have from this segment here, we have basically a fragment ion map which is chromatography for the fragment ion intensities. And now we can go in exactly as we do by SRM or also by PRM. We can go to a library where we have the reference spectra um, that are associated with a particular peptide sequence. And this would be the spectra that would maybe generated by the map that we initially attempted to, to generate. And then we can say, if we want to look for a particular peptide that has a, cer a certain sequence, has certain mass, has certain fragment ion, ion certain fragment ion masses, then we can instruct the computer to find in this segment here the, the fragment ion chromatograms and basically um, extract them and generate a data structure which is exactly how the SRM or PRM data so the idea is, um, to put it very simply, to fragment everything that is in a sample and is recognized by a mass spectrometer, to, but to, to fragment everything in a way that the data have a structure which is similar to what we used to from SRM or PRM targeted experiments, to then use prior information to deconvolute these very complicated fragment ion maps and to generate data where we have, again, ion chromatograms of fragment ions that have to covalute, that have a certain intensity, that have a certain mass. And this information here, this peak group, is a unique identifier for a targeted peptide. So we're not going to discover any new peptides. We need a library of spectra, although there is now movement in the field that these libraries are, can be created directly on the fly. I don't want to go into this. It's for reasons of time, but in principle, we need to have some form of prior information, and we search then the based on that. That's why the term peptide centric is such a nice term. We have the peptide. We so we center our analysis around this peptide. And we basically ask the question: Is in this data set the peptide based on the prior information, its mass, sequence, fragment line mass, fragment line intensity, and so on? Right? Is there a single group which uniquely identifies this peptide? in the data set, and if this is the case, then we can say we have found this peptide, we know it's in the sample, and it is a certain intensity which reflects the abundance or concentration of this peptide. So the upshot um, of this development for where we would like to go, to generate a matrix of data of peptides versus samples, is actually fairly profound. Um, so it brings us a very large step forward to where we really would like to be. And this is data that were published from a, from a company um, from Diagnosis who built a business on this type of EIA analysis. And they did an experiment to demonstrate the performance of, of, the, of the tool, the, the data discovery approach and this massively parallel targeting approach on the same instrument on the same sample. 
So they basically generated a sample to lysate of the human cell line. They injected this into this by LCMS and MS on the same instrument, and they operated the instrument either in discovery mode or in this EIA uh, mode. Everything else, the same sample, same instrument, the only thing is how the instrument is being run. And they did it um, some 25 or so times. And here we see the in red, the data from the DIA, and in blue, the data from the DDA, from the discovery mode. And what we see here is, is, is the accumulation of number of peptides that have been seen in one out of one, in three out of three, in nine out of nine, or 24 out of 24, repeat analysis of the same sample on the same instrument. And we see that because the DDA instrument is is not consistently measuring the same peptides. It measures the same peptides, measures the peptides very reliably, highly confidently, but it does not sample all, always the same peptides. And we generate a data matrix that has lots of missing values, which is reflected here in a decrease of the number of peptides that are consistently measured. If we have a cohort of samples, and this is only 25, you can imagine if we had hundreds then the number of peptides consistently measured across the whole cohort would further decrease. And the EIA method, which they call hyperreaction monitoring, which is basically the same, same name for the same thing, stays quite nicely up there. I mean, it's not perfect. There is issues which I think Mike will dis discuss uh, tomorrow about scoring and confidence of scoring. But, but the, that basically the number of peptides consistently identified is considerably higher and it manifests itself in this graph as relatively few missing values. Yes? Yes, so the issue of um, libraries, so, as, so the background of the question is that in, in order to do this targeted data extraction, we need some form of prior information that is referred to as a, as a spectral library. And so there is several ways how to generate these libraries. They can be either generated from the type of sample that one would analyze. This is probably the best, uh, cleanest way, because we then would have basically a representation of the spectra from the sample. Or one could, um, one could make a, a basic a pan-human library which contains spectra for, let's say, the whole species. And this has been investigated now fairly intensely. and. Um, Actually, Mike McCoss's group and our group are, are finalizing some kind of guideline or at least analysis of this issue. The, the, the upshot is that either way is fine. Um, one has, however, if one uses a library that has many more entries than peptides that are present in this sample, one has to be fairly, fairly careful to minimize the inflation, which is a result of, of multiple hypotheses tested. But I think this has been work quite reasonably worked out so that if one takes suitable procedures and precautions, one can avoid an inflation of false positives if the library is much larger than the number of peptides actually uh, in the sample. And one now also there is from the group of Alexei Nishwiski is a tool, he has developed a tool which generates libraries directly from the sample based on DIA data. It's called DIA, DIA umpire and it also has actually uh, performs quite well. Yeah, the whole question. Okay. So what I talked about so far is only for naked peptides. However, it does certainly uh, uh, not escape us that very interesting biology is in modified peptides. And I think Jake will talk about uh, modified peptides in some detail. The issue with the, the issue with modified peptides in the case like you describe, you will have you might have one phosphate, which of course you can recognize by the mass, but you have multiple sites where this phosphate will attach. Is that is the question whether you have sufficient fragment ions that distinguish between the various possible attachment sites. And this can be, at times, very challenging. 
simply because I mean, if there's, if there's no information, no spectral information, spectra don't look different, no search tool will find it. So what we have observed, and this is actually not clear how, how many others have observed this too, is that along the lines of the chromatographic separation, often, but we don't know how frequently, peptides which have the same backbone sequence, the same number of phosphates with, at a different site, will separate. But sometimes they do not, and it's, it's not clear actually how often this occurs. But if it does occur, then you can use the retention time as a constraint and say peptide that is the same mass, same number of phosphocytes diluted a little earlier than the other was maybe the one which has one, one attachment site and not the other. So we're not actually quite sure how, how general this, this is. Probably also depends a bit on the chromatographic conditions, but what I'm saying basically in short is that if the spectrum itself, the fragnine spectrum itself, is not sufficient, neither a DDA search engine nor a DIA search engine will find it. Because the information simply is not there. But if you use a targeted approach, you have at least the option, if they separate, to use the chromatographic retention time as a, as a differential. Okay, so, so to conclude this part, of course, time will. Um, what, what we I introduced is two different kind of branches of data acquisition. And now, uh, towards the end, <coughs> I said if we use data independent acquisition and targeted data and statistical extraction, there is, a, there is a platform to generate this data matrix, which is very high quality, so it's kind of a synthesis of both approaches. And the you know, hundreds of conditions are clearly feasible, and the number of proteins identified in the range of a few thousand with modern machines. This is roughly the state of the art. So now, um, since we have this, since we have now the tools to generate such data, it is worth maybe, and this is not, per not perfect, I mean, we would like to go as deep as possible and we would like to have as many samples, but let's say you're investigating as, an, as a budget for, of a certain number of dollars and you have to spend this, this data on your, uh, these, these dollars on your sample, and you can ask, should I dig deeper down into the samples, identify more proteins, or should I run more samples? So now I'd like to spend a few minutes to uh, discuss what dimensions should the data matrix have to, to be maximally useful. And this is, this is actually um, work that uh, I shouldn't represent, this is work from Ping from Olga's group, and um, I'm, she has done a lot more work on this question. It's a very important question, and she has done beautiful work, and I'm just doing a very short abbreviation just to make a few important points. It's, I say it's a very important question because when we submit a paper where we have measured a few hundred samples, by a DAA method, uh, we get almost inevitably the response from reviewers back and said, you have not measured enough proteins. So what we, what we are faced with is that we would maintain that a, a data matrix which is <coughs> not, not as deep, but has very few missing values, has more information than one that is very, very deep but spotty. Uh, over, over the whole. And so we always get this response and uh, we now hope to publish paper with Ping's work to alleviate or to get clarity into the, in this, this discussion. So this is um, what Ping tried to do is to, is to say where should we, if we have this certain amount of research dollars and time, should we go more higher number of proteins or higher number of subjects. And this scenario she's using is a biomarker scenario where we say we have two cohorts, a healthy and a disease affected, and let's say we would have the blood 
plasma or tissue of these cohort individuals, and we know that there is um, biomarkers that distinguish them, but we, under what conditions do we find them uh, as, as, as well as possible? So this is the, this is the, the question. And to, to, to do this analysis, she used data that are published to ask what is the data structure in terms of errors, uh, variability of the, of the signals, and basically the variability of quantification. So one is a data set from um, where the quantification was done by spectrum counting. This is um, a C C P tap P T. You know this. So uh, this was a proteomic. This C P tap. This is the colorectal set data, and this is counted by this quantified by spectrum count. Basically, ask in DDA mode how many times do you see the particular peptide, and you transform this frequency into. Second is a data set by SLM, and the third is a EIA data set. And so if we analyze these data, in, and this would be the intensity, basically the magnitude of the signals, and if uh, for virtually every um, analytical technique, if you have a high signal to noise, then the signals are usually quite robust. If you get a very low signal to, to noise, the signal becomes more noisy. And this leads to this trumpet flow that you see very nicely here. You see fairly good uh, standard deviation of intensities, and then eventually for the lower running side, this is called the, pop, this, this is the trumpet flow. And here, this was not the case because the proteins were peptides were selected in a way by SRM that they already have low variability. And here is something which we don't actually understand. It starts like a trumpet flow, but then it gets better. It's actually still not very clear to any of us. Anyway, being learned, this, this noise behavior or uh, from these data sets and then generated some scenarios. Basically, she took this uh, NCI, what doesn't matter what it is, this small data set and, and, put, and divided it into quintiles of very robust signals and eventually very noisy signals. And then she put into each one of these quintiles, uh, all by simulation, biomarkers that would if they were found, distinguish these groups. And then, um, so this is basically the starting position, then she did simulations to ask what, um, if I add more proteins to this analysis, which were with the, bio, the putative biomarker sprinkled over the quintiles, how could I identify, how could I separate these groups if I had um, more proteins or more samples or both. So um, the results are, uh, and she did a lot of work, which maybe she can at some point describe, or hopefully we can read, uh, write it up soon. But the, the conclusion from many, many, many simulations of this type is always the same. If you if you go down here in the number of proteins, um, if you go over in the number of proteins, you gain. So, so here this would be green is high, here violet is high, and high is good. So basically, it is the, the mean sensitivity of identifying the predicted protein or predicted vectors. So it, it basically high means here that <coughs> the separation of biomarkers would be found with a high uh, level of confidence. And lower numbers means that's not the case. So the lower the number, the worse the biomarker finding scenario is predicted. So we see here that by going up the number of proteins, we, um, we gain some, but then when we go up in further, we actually lose some. So the performance gets worse. And that is, of course, explainable by the fact that if we keep adding proteins to the data set, we increase the number, necessarily we will, we will add proteins which have a very or noise behavior, very noisy. And so if we add noisy data to an inherently rather informative data, it would be drawn out and eventually the signal to the biosystem. So this clearly comes out 
from these simulations. And in every simulation, in every case, in every noise case, it was always so that when the number of samples increased, the performance, performance increased, and the number of proteins increased, the performance initially increased with some optimum, and then eventually decreased the signal that was thrown out by the samples. So I think this is now, this, uh, she actually is building a, a kind of a predictor for, a, for such a, an experiment or a study that one, one would could predict if we have certain noise behavior in our data, how many samples and how many proteins and which proteins should we analyze that we obtain an optimal result. But the upshot is that it's very clear, and we have now also from other approaches, uh, very similar uh, ideas, very similar findings, that if we have a certain amount of research money and time to spend, we should always spend it on increasing the number of samples at potentially at the cost of, um, of the number of proteins that could be measured. Although, of course, we don't want to go down to one protein. But if we, if we, um, but, but the, clearly the dimension that always wins is the dimension of more samples. This brings up interesting, um, interesting questions from the experimental side. How do we get cohorts? When you go to a hospital, and want to do a clinical study, you will easily find a clinical scientist who says, I have 50 samples. But if you say, well, 50 samples based on things model is not good, you should have 500, there will many will say, well, we don't have. And um, so I think this brings up a number of interesting issues. But I think this, from the data, from the data acquisition point of view, it is very clear where we should spend our money. Okay, now I was running behind. So I want to, maybe I go quickly through that because I think it's also an interesting topic. We, um, we would like, we, now sh we have now seen from these three data sets, different types of acquisition techniques that the different techniques have always some noise, uh, noise behind them. So no measurement technique, of course, is perfect. And there's always variability in the data, some of which is technical. But what is also not considered is, or which is not frequently considered, that there's also, of course, biological noise. And that this is this biological noise, or biological variability, rather, is what we really would like to know. So most bio biologists are conditioned to say, I do an experiment in a cell, maybe it's a particular strain of a yeast cell, a particular mouse genotype, or, or, or a human cell line of some type, certain type. And then they keep this invariant, and they do an experiment in this cell line, and they might find some behavior, and a certain signaling pathway might be turned on, or, and then they can measure that. In reality, biology doesn't work that way. In reality, biology works in populations, and each individual has a different background and has a certain, beha certain variability behavior in the molecular makeup that this individual or this cell has. And Friday, I'm coming back to this point. So we, 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 we try to address this to, to some, some extent. Now let's assume that we can measure this data matrix with fairly good precision and now we would like to do a cohort study of a biomarker like was simulated here, blood biomarker. If we, are, if we find a protein, we have relatively few samples, and we find a protein that is highly variable in a human population, and we have 10 controls and 10 samples, we might just simply by chance find that this protein, which is highly variable, is highly expressed in those, in these few individuals that we took as controls, and low expressed in those that we took as um, as case, simply by chance. If the variability is very low, the chance for that happening would be very different, much much lower. So it is important that we know where does the variability, how how big is the variability in a population, especially if we want to do cohort studies, and how. <coughs> and then of course it would be subsequent question is where does the variability 
come from and that it tells us something biologically interesting. So that's what we try to um, address here. And we, try, we address this in the context of, uh, of plasma protein. And plasma is probably the most widely studied human sample. There's millions of research papers have been published. But in fact, we know very little about the variability of protein abundance in a population. We know very little why they vary, and we, we, do, we don't know whether this is actually constant. So most biomarker studies are done with a cohort of, 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 of individuals that span a certain age range, but we, we, we might, maybe adults, but if, for instance, children had a completely different variability because age increases the variability, if you assume that, then what we find in adults, especially old adults, would be completely irrelevant. So there's a lot we don't know, and now I'm very quickly go through a study where we tried to address this, is what I just said, and we tried, <laughs> so we did, I mean, this is a postdoc, Yan Sheng Lu, did a twin study to, to ask how variable are proteins, and detectable proteins, it's certainly a statement about the whole plasma <coughs> proteome, but the detectable protein, proteins by this DIA method, and where does this variability come from? Is it genetic? Is it through some life experience, or is it age? So the study was to take <coughs> a cohort, this is a typical twin study design, where you would have identical monozygotic twins and some dizygotic twins, which are not, uh, which are not uh, genetically identical, but these are. And then we were able to obtain from a cohort, uh, twin cohort in the UK, from uh, Tim Spector, uh, we obtained blood taken from the, each one of these individuals at two, two about five to seven years apart in their, in their life. So we have a time axis, we have a genetic axis, because if the variability is genetic, then these should be much closer to each other than those, because they're genetically more different. So there is formalism, which certainly we did not invent, which allows us to, um, so this is the, this is the measurement, um, 36 monocycles twin pairs, 22 dicycles twin <coughs> pairs, two measurements from time and time apart, and these were um, 232 plasma measurements. And then, through, through formalism which has been worked out, um, we can appro a proportion the variability detected for each protein, whether it is from due to genetics, to environment, or age. I don't want to go into this formulas. This is the data. So he managed to quantify um, slightly more than 3,000 peptides against uh, across these twins. And um, skip this, just quality control. He shows that the, that the peptides actually are have very different variability in this population, which is uh, r remarkable. There's some that are extremely variable. And we know this is not technical variability because they, did, they have repeat analysis, and some are very stable. So this is the formalism, which I don't want to get into, but we basically are able to a proportion the variability that is seen for each protein across this population of, an, of some hundred uh, plus individuals, so whether it's due to variability, genetics, and that's, that's due to the fact that the variability is smaller in monozygotic twins than in dizygotics, then it has this genetic uh, component, that is called genetic diversity. Or environment, or longitudinal effect, or unexplained. Unexplained basically means something else. So here we see, these are the proteins taken here of the X axis, and these are the different colors where this variability comes from. And it's actually, I thought, uh, I was actually quite excited about this, because it is remarkable how, how different these various sources of variability affect the human plasma protein. So these are proteins which have a very, very sizable genetic component, so their, their abundance is very tightly genetically controlled. Others, um, like um, the yellow ones, which have a lot of yellow, are those which change a lot during aging. Five to seven years of the lifetime, the variability already changed, usually it increases. 
you know, if we, and so we could, we could talk a lot about the various sources and why certain proteins might have to be more stable than others. And of course, one can do analysis, what do these proteins do and what's their function? I don't have time to get into that. But I want to make a few, uh, just, just two points in the interest of time. Here we, we selected a number of proteins from papers, and each one of these papers described in one of these proteins or more than one as putative biomarker for a particular disease. And all of these have the characteristic that they have very strong longitudinal effect. That means the variability that is observed changes quite a lot over the lifetime, even a part of the lifetime of these individuals. None of these proteins ever made it into a validated biomarker, and I think this is probably one of the reasons. Because they are simply were measured in a cohort which had a certain age distribution, and then when people try to validate these proteins as biomarkers, maybe in another age distribution, and it all fell apart because basically they had a confounding effect, which is age. And so we also did the opposite, which I'm not showing here. We selected a number of biomarkers which actually made it through the very tedious uh, validation process to the FDA, and they have very different uh, noise or um, variability characteristics, and they tend to be highly determined by, uh, by genetic components. So generally, this is another finding, which I think is an interesting finding, generally the genetic determination of, very, of the protein variability decreased with age. So this was 9.1, 9.2, and this is the age two is the heritability contribution to the variation. So it seems that initially, when we're young, our genome tends to control the abundance of the proteins uh, to, to a certain extent, and this seems to dec decrease considerably over age. And I think this is an interesting finding for biomarker studies. Okay, so now um, what I showed in what, what I want to show in this sample, in this example, um, is that we're we're also in this course. You have been talking a lot about variability, about noise, about signal to noise, and this is is oftentimes framed from the point of view of technical variability that's introduced. But equally interesting it is to see, I think, from a biological point of view, what is the actual biological variability? Can we distinguish it from technical variability? That's, of course, the first step. And then I think equally interesting it is asked, how is this variability determined? Is it, and what does it try to tell us um, uh, uh, biologically? And so with this twin study, we try to get some, some insight in some of these factors. So now um, uh, I can I can st stop or I can go to the last point. We have 15 minutes, okay. Okay. So the last point I wanted to discover, I discuss, is one that you probably already have um, discussed, and that is issues of batch correction, confounding factors, and so on. I just would like to now bring this back what you treated theoretically in the in the kind of real life laboratory acquisition of proteomic data. The question I'd like to discuss briefly is how can we can we avoid recognizing correct artifactual variation, basically confounding effects. So we we already, already discussed this, I think a very great detail. And it, I think what we learn as from coming from the experimental side, there's no experiment we can do which does not really have some form of confounding factors, artifacts, distortions, or, or whatever you want to call it. And here I use an example from the field of genomics, which is a striking example. Because it's not, show, not just showing how that we have a problem, but that if the problem is not dealt with or not recognized, it leads to fundamentally wrong or different solution. So this is a, a, a 
study that came to Mao's town and called consortium, and it reported the comparative gene expression patterns. This is not on protein level, this is on transcript level, between tissues of human in Mao's. And so basically, these, these uh, scientists, they got equivalent tissue from human to mouse, and then it uh, clustered them, basically measured transcripts and clustered, clustered them together. And the conclusion was that, um, that the, uh, they clustered basically by species. Tend to cluster more by species than by tissue. So that they will conclude that a mouse lung, the human lung, would be uh, more, would be further apart than tissues within the same organ. And then the same data were reanalyzed um, by because they were recognizing some, some of the statisticians <coughs> that reanalyzed this data were, were finding out that these samples, that, that the samples were run in different flow cells based on, on species, the samples from the, from the species were run in different flow cells. There was an effect on the data acquisition. And when they reanalyzed this data, taking out this effect coming from the data acquisition side because different batches were run under different conditions, the whole picture completely changed. Now the tissues were clustering together and no longer the species. So basically what this is, I think, very illustrative <coughs> example, it's a drastic one, but it illustrates that if we have data that are being generated necessarily by uh, these ba that contain necessarily batch effects, but if we don't recognize that, then we may, we may come up with wrong conclusions, actually fundamentally wrong conclusions. So I think you talked already about experimental design, and I don't have time or don't want to do this here because I'm also not the best qualified. But I would like to show now in a real, real life example from this DIA world, where we were exactly facing similar issues like this uh, ENCODE people. And the experiment was the following. We have two, we have two cell lines. Um, prostate cancer cell lines doesn't really matter what they, what they do, but they, they have different classes of prostate cancer. One is castration resistant, one is not. And so these are two, implement, two kind of forms of prostate cancer. And one is responsive and one is non-responsive to a particular drug that's used in the clinic, an androgen receptor inhibitor. And so we wanted to, we wanted to do a classical dose response study on two cells, one responsive and one non-responsive, to find whether the responsive cell behaved very different or somewhat different or identical to the responsive cell, and whether we could find molecular patterns that distinguish them. So the experimental design was to take two cells to have a concentration um, do dosage curve and have a time curve. And this ended up, even though we only have two cells in one question, basically, with a fairly high number of samples, 250 samples. So this for proteomic standards is a reasonably large, not super large, but a reasonably large um, cohort. And we, we analyzed this by Schwartz mass spectrometry. So we did, we were as careful as we could with, with batches for processing, with blocks where we, where we randomized things around. And then we were very happy that we were able to generate data on these more than 200 samples. And the close to 5,000 proteins were identified in, in, in every sample, more quite in every one you see here. These are the proteins from 50, 100%, so from, from our point of view, this is a very nice data set. And then um, we talked with some statisticians and we asked, um, now I'm coming on somewhat 
slippery terrain for my uh, for my uh, for my knowledge base. But we asked now, what type of effect would we be able to see from this data? So uh, I could not describe this method, but Olga could, and probably Tim could. So they statistician performed a huge bit of very important analysis, the way I understand it. We simply ask which effects, if present, would be able to see. As you can clearly see, the difference of the cell line has a huge effect, which is expected. Replicates have some effect, obviously, this is not perfect, this should actually be small. And then, but, but, but things like dosage, time, and so on, are basically not detected. So we knew from this analysis, even though the actual data here look look very exciting to us as data generators, that if we just use this data as such, we will not get information about the really the things we want to know, namely how do they respond over time to the, to the drug. So we then looked further into this and looked for instance for intensities. So these were various factors, and we basically time progressing in how samples were analyzed, and we see that they don't, this is kind of called line current, measured by batch, and we see that it's a continuous decrease in, in, in the performance of the instrument. So this is not necessarily bad. Uh, it's not good, of course, but it's not necessarily distorting the results, because you could, um, you, you will simply see here a, a decrease in the average signal, which you could basically normalize up, uh, by some median transformation, and some protein detected it here, where you have higher intensity, might no longer be detected again. But this is this is common. It's probably quite drastic here. But that's not really. Um, this would be fairly easy to correct. But it actually wasn't wasn't the source. I mean, it didn't correct the effect. So now I, I show I show what happens when we use the data as they came out without any correction, and what we can learn. So this is a cluster graph where the proteins are clustered against the samples. What we would expect is that we can certainly separate the cell lines, which actually we did. So this would be the cell lines were separated very nicely. So this is not an interesting question. It's basically useless. And we would expect that the biological replicates, which are shown here in gray or yellow, they should be uh, always one and one, one and one, one and one, because these replicates are next to each other. It should be anyway, and that's not the case. So basically, what we, we see here are what we call blocks of replicate one and then some replicate two, replicate one. So the so clearly we lost information of, uh, that is biologically relevant. We can make a trivial statement that we have two classes, which is that we know we have two cell lines. But what we really would like to know, how they respond to drugs, um, we cannot see because not even the replicates go with each other. So it's too noisy. And then various people tried various um, corrections. And this is a very simple batch correction, mean centering. That's what we would attempt to do by, by this continuously decreasing uh, intensity. And it actually didn't do a whole lot. So we can still see here two cell lines, the two perfectly separated. This one, biological replicates here is slightly better, but not really much better. So we still would say that when we would like to find a relatively small effect on this proteome, which is biologically significant, we will not see it, because it's, it's still too noisy. And then, so various, um, various attempts were on, undertaken. And um, this one here is from a, a sabbatical recipient, Theodora Matsilas, who's a Greek statistician. And she basically used a much more sophisticated batch correction, which used each one of these blocks as individual. And so the upshot is that now, when we look at the biological replicates, it is not perfect, but in what we call a fairly large area, we now see always one at one at one or two. Of course, since they were run time fairly far apart in time, 
in the in the real time. So this would indicate to us that this was so far the most successful approach to deal uh, to batch correct in this for this um, in this data set. And now we can start to look, or at least we attempt to look for biological signal. So the the reason I brought this up is because I, I thought you would have already discussed various of these uh, aspects of confounding, batch correction, and so on. And what we learned the hard way from here, if you, if you live in the real world of acquiring data in a laboratory, we learned that there's various types of effects that, have, that require different solutions. We learned, for instance, another study which I don't show, that the simple decrease of intensity um, of the instrument, or let's say sensitivity of the instrument, is not really a big deal. We can correct for that by some mean transformation actually quite well. However, in this particular data set, the, the error we looked at is fairly, uh, or the source of the variability was different. It was not just an intensity, but, but qualitatively different peptides were detected. And this is probably the case that in one batch or over a certain time, the digestion was not as reproducible or not the same as in another batch and simply transforming the intensities did not work because you were transforming the wrong thing. So we had to go back to learn how what was the source error and then to try to find a more sophisticated correction exercise. So I think what, the, what I conclude from this is um, certainly for our work is that we want to be extremely careful with trying to avoid this batch effects from the beginning by being, of course, documenting and being as reproducible as possible. But probably even more important is that we find ways to recognize that such uh, possibly inevitable effects happen, that we can recognize them and then, then try to correct them in a way that is, a, that is appropriate for this type of, of, um, of noise or variability that has been brought in. And um, certainly for us, this is, these were new insights and I think for many proteomics labs, this would be the same. And this cannot really be done by saying, well, we do some form of, of batch correction uh, to every data set because there's, it depends, at least we learned here, on the source of the actual problem. Some may simply not be correctable at all. And then one would have to rather possibly discard the data rather than draw the wrong conclusions, as was the case in the in the initial samples. So with that, I would like to stop here. What I try to discuss is basically the point of view from the data generators, gener generation side, and that um, even though you learn a lot of statistics and, and analytical techniques, I think it's always a good idea to also look at the data generation side and try to understand what the issues are that, that come from the data, because none of the data sets that you will ever analyze are actually perfect. They all have flaws, they all have difficulties and challenges, and I think the more one knows about also the source of the data, and what they actually means, and what issues are associated with the particular technique, the more likely it is that at the other end, something uh, meaningful will come up. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer some uh, questions if we have still time. Well, it's basically just uh, a name for it's it's so it's a it's a it's a DIA method, but for copyright reason I couldn't call it DIA or SWAS, so they called it something different. But it is it is exactly the same, just on a on a different instrument. So, uh, so the data I showed, which we call SWAS, is acquired on on instruments from a particular company called Cyx, and for copyright reasons, if you do the same, exactly the same acquisition on an instrument from, for instance, Thermo, which is the biggest supplier, it cannot be called that, so they invented the term uh, HRM. It's actually quite a cool term because it is uh, it, it chose to be do reaction monitoring, but at the at the higher scale. So it's not it's not anything different, just different name due to uh, 
actually speak to Jesus. So we're not actually saying, just to correct, we're not actually saying the age determines the abundance, but the variability. Uh, that's observed in this in this twin uh, population. So yes, I, I, I do think that one would need to factor this in uh, if one wanted to go to FTA, and now that we know that this is an issue, I would certainly construct such a study. If I wanted to go to FTA for approval, I would probably construct it with a validation cohort of maybe different ages or a, or a broad, uh, broad range, but in some way I think one should factor this in because I think this is exactly why uh, these selected examples that we selected just randomly out of the literature, they all failed. And I think this is plausible that the reason they failed is because the age, uh, age contributes so much to the variability. Then, so the criteria applied from validation cohorts would never make it. 